Okay, turn in your Bibles to Romans, the fourth chapter, tonight. Tonight, we're only going to take a few minutes. This is our last class, and then we, we thought we would close it with a real good, beautiful time of prayer. We're praying over the rap sessions on every single uh, session now and focusing on prayer, soul winning, in a very uh, emphatic way in the ministry. Romans, the fourth chapter, and we're just going to go through uh, these verses tonight. Uh, so here we start with verse 4. Verse 4, Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace. That is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Let's go over that again. To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now this has trouble literally scores and scores of Christians throughout the ages. Christians who are in movements in Christianity that just do not understand this principle. It's a very important principle because a Christian who has had in his past, the tarnished image, the fallen image, the image that he constantly and continually projects in various uh, facets of his life. And now, when that tarnished image takes on wrong doctrine, a doctrine that isn't precisely correct, accurate, that isn't mature, then that individual's tarnished image begins to be reflected in the doctrine that isn't accurate. Now, the fallen image prevents people from ruling with Jesus Christ because when we receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, we reign in life by one Jesus Christ. And when God created man perfect in Eden, he told them to rule, and he made them in his own image. And then came the tarnished image, the fallen image, and with that, all kinds of problems. So God's program of justification by faith through grace is so relevant, you don't get confused when you understand it. This is the reason why these folks that say that the, you have to be baptized with the Spirit in order to be saved, you have to keep Saturday in order to be saved, you have to enter into religious works in order to be saved, you have to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and thank God He is Lord and we should have Him Lord, but you have to have Him as Lord in order to be saved. Uh, even if you're a brand new believer. And all of these statements that are being made come from a tarnished image privately interpreting the Word of God outside of positional truth. A fallen image trying to interpret the Word of God in the glorious gospel outside of the Holy Spirit's revelation of the pure gospel of grace. Now when Paul said, let if any man preach any other gospel but the gospel of pure grace, let him be accursed. So therefore, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. Now you see it up on your screen. We've, as usual, exegeted it for you. To de Ergazomai, and it's a present active participle, one of whom's works are characteristics. 
Erga means to work, to labor, to perform, and him that worketh is one who is characterized by works and is active in them constantly. Is the reward, ho mythos, mythos, is a masculine noun, and it means we get exactly what we work for, the fruit which results from toils and the energy of the flesh. It usually refers to the rewards received in this life. But then we have the logizomai, the present active indicative, which deals with it's not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now, when a preacher doesn't understand the finished work, then he ministers and communicates grace plus works. Romans 11.6 totally discredits that type of uh, philosophy. And when he does enter into grace plus works, the preacher doesn't realize it, but he's ministering to your tarnished image. image. And you're bearing the image of Adam trying to get into a works program to appease your guilt and to appease the real problem and the core problem of emptiness that prevails in the Adam uh, construct in the old nature. So consequently, this tarnished image causes a broken relationship with Jesus Christ. And the relationship is broken because there's no way that you and I can ever satisfy Jesus Christ with a system of adding to grace. Can't be done. He gets all the glory and receives all the glory in the grace of God. And that's it. And we grow in grace and knowledge of his lordship progressively, but never under God's heaven can we ever have good relationships outside of grace. Now, there are people in every ministry, including this ministry, who do not have a lot of good relationships. And the reason is they have never been able to understand their tarnished image. And the tarnished image of the fallen Adam can't rule, just can't rule. It's a victim of defeat. So because it's defeated, it'll always do its very best to try to be acceptable if it has a religious nature. So it takes on a religious nature, tries to get accepted, privately interprets scriptures, gets into the letter of the word of God, adopts a legalistic system, and as this legalistic system is adopted, it becomes a denominational banner, a denominational uh, presentation of what that denomination believes and if God Almighty and the Holy Spirit clearly teaches the difference the denomination comes ahead of what the Word of God says because that's in the manual and that's exactly what happens and then comes the fallen image that can't reign through grace and righteousness now when Romans 5 17 that we talked about tonight they which receive the abundance of grace, inexhaustible, unlimited supply through the finished work of Calvary and the gift of righteousness, the perfect eye, the PR of God, the perfect righteousness, then one reigns in life. Why? Because he's renewed, he is renewed, she is renewed in the knowledge of a new image. And that new image is totally detached from the old image and the old image in God's view has passed away, and the believer being renewed daily in knowledge in Colossians 3, 9, and 10, and Ephesians 4, 22, 23, 24, now is bearing the image of the second Adam and bearing the image of resurrection and ascension, and he now, through redemption and restoration, is getting back into his original creative purpose, which is to reign again as to reign under the leadership of Jesus Christ, the King and the head of that individual. So any time there is a system, a legalistic system of any kind that demands and demands and demands and always exhorts outside of the finished work river of grace, 
you'll, you'll have believers who will have strained and broken relationships. People make commitments in the church, enthusiastic commitments, and often these enthusiastic commitments enter into a cold war in relationships because they can't be sustained by this system they have, which is not finished work. Now, at the same time, many people get very enthused about marriage only to enter into amazing problems in marriage because a man with a broken relationship from a tarnished image, he has a broken relationship with God's grace and a tarnished, tarnished image, so he tries to be a happy married man. And this really produces a negative effect in his relationship because if he isn't totally free and totally released in his relationship with Jesus Christ, he certainly isn't going to be free day in and day out, night in and night out, week in and week out, year in and week, year out with the same person of whom he is now very familiar with and of whom he feels inadequate before God and tries to be adequate before that person. Jobs be, make him insecure. Economic problems make him insecure. Pressures make him insecure. Time without worldly success makes him insecure. Why? There's an inadequate relationship with God. And he's living in a fallen image that is discouraged. Why did Jesus Christ never, ever get discouraged in his humanity? And Isaiah 42, 2 says he never got discouraged. The Holy Spirit brings it out because he always reflected the image of the Father in his humanity and never gave in to a tarnished image, to a defiled image. This is the reason why in business men get so frustrated. And the moment they're outside of hearing the word of God and outside of Christian uh, provisions and Christian environment, and when things go bad, a man's temper will jump up and he's just like the devil himself. And he'll do it against Christians. He'll do it against Christians. And he acts ugly and hateful and he disgraces the very name of Jesus, even if it's only with one person. And he blows his steam off and he goes away like a little runt, pouting in stubbornness. And it's all tarnished image. And he's reflecting some disappointments in childhood, some disappointments in his teenage years, and he's reflecting his Adam makeup, his Adam personality, and he becomes per personality becomes an issue, economics become an issue, people become an issue, the social situation becomes an issue, and these things become an issue because his fallen nature is not secure in life's present tense events. That's a very sad thing because you give him everything and he'll be happy for the change, but he won't be happy forever after the change. Well, he'll be happy for six months, three months, two months, but he won't be happy because he's got a tarnished image. And God says, be renewed in the image of the word of God of categorical doctrine, of governmental doctrine, be renewed, be renewed in your image. You've got to be renewed daily. Now, you know very well that some of you have, have lost a lot of energy and been unnecessarily strange with God in your fellowship, and it's all because of image. And the minute that image takes over, we immediately enter into a broken relationship with God. And our mind is on things and issues that distract us, that distract us from the amazing, glorious gospel and precious communion with Jesus Christ. To him that worketh not, but believeth, Pistuo Dei, present active participle, continually produces the action of believing. Continually, present tense, active voice, the believer does the believing in, in the object, the, the promises of God. The participle here 
is the divine truth of reality in salvation. The divine truth in reality in salvation. On him that justifieth, epiton de kaio, is a present active participle, the ungodly. So God justifies the ungodly from the negative A, the ungodly, without, and sibomai, to worship or venerate, basically means without fear and reverence to God. The idea is man is taken as he is and pardoned as he is, and he doesn't have to change to be accepted. Now that's what this is saying. I'll give it to you again. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. And we just went over the ungodly. His faith. Hey, peace, peace, auto. His faith. The feminine noun of responding to the gospel. The nominative case is the, his faith is the instrument of being saved by the, through grace, through grace, and through Jesus Christ. And therefore, this particular believer has counted his faith, logizomai, present passive indicative. He continually produces the, the action of, he receives the action of his faith being counted. Passive voice, indicative mood, declarative. The indicative mood is declarative and me, it means this is a, a declarative statement made by God Almighty through the Holy Spirit and his faith is counted, it is imputed to that person in a substitutionary manner for righteousness. Eis daikaiosuni. And that's a feminine noun and extends into the accusative case of he receiving the accurate, perfect righteousness of God. So therefore, in view of this, when you understand this, you begin to realize that only this process is the beginning of a brand new image. And listen, some counselor can counsel you from now to Jesus coming back. And you know what happens? The counselor gets into your past to try to dig out some problems that will release you. Well, you start digging out things in my Adam nature and you're going to make me occupied with who? Adam. You're going to make me self-centered in what? The fall. You're going to get me to be self-centered in the fall. I know what you say. You say, well, if he brings him out, then I can take him to Jesus. No, no, that's not the way it is. This is how it works. I want to give you an illustration. When Isaiah, who'd been a carnal preacher for 42 years, and you know how he got right? He didn't get right in a counseling session. Do you know how he got right? One day he saw the Lord high and lifted up after the king that he respected in patriotism died after 52 years of reigning as king. He saw the Lord Jesus high and lifted up and his train filled his temple. And then he saw the seraphims with six wings. With two, their face was covered. With two, their feet were covered. And with two of the wings, they did fly. Now, you couldn't identify the seraphim because of the humility of their ministry in the presence of Jesus Christ. And then they looked to each other. They looked to each other and they said, holy, holy, holy. It would be just like you and I having seen this amazing thing and we looked to each other and in aston astonishment we say, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then came the shaking of the foundation in the temple. The smoke came in and the door was shaken. That's a picture of God through his glorified position shaking the foundation of the natural, a human structure, a human construct. At this time, all of a sudden, 
Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Now what showed him that he was undone? Seeing the perfect Christ in his glorified humanity, representing men in the throne of God in the finished work ascension. He said, I'm undone, and I'm a man with unclean lips. Now, why didn't Isaiah go for counseling and have the counselor dig out all the years that he failed? That's what some of you would do. You're bound to do it. You don't like it when I teach the finished work on this subject because it's touchy. And why didn't Isaiah said, now, I didn't realize I'd been preaching my preaching's been off for 40 years. Why did I have the unclean lips? Will you help me, counselor? And the counselor says now, well, Isaiah, what was your daddy like? And then that takes about 10 sessions, providing daddy was quite a character. Well, what was your mummy like? Were you a younger brother, an older brother? No, I was next. Well, what was your older brother like? What was the first teacher you had like? And that thing goes on for six years. Then Isaiah finally finds a new counselor. And then he finally gets a new And every one of them stimulated their new face and they seem to care. Now it took Isaiah approximately five minutes to be healed. Of course, you don't want that because that takes a miracle. I mean, that can happen and do away all that attention you want. And he said, then Isaiah, instead of counseling, he had to see something terrible. The angel comes and takes a, a coal from off the altar, Calvary, and puts the coal right on the tongue, purges his sin. And, and the words come, sin has been purged. Oh, no, it can't be that easy. I need to be tormented for all these 40 years of backsliding. I need to be shaken up. I need to be punished. Come on, say something so I can go home with guilt and cry. No, 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 no. Your sin has been purged. You know what purge means? It means the effects has been taken away. Cleansing is when God cleans your capacity. Purging is when God takes away the effects of your sin. So what happens? Isaiah had to come out of there saying, I gotta cancel my counseling appointments. I just, I'm clean. Now I'm clean through the word. Now I'm clean through the word. Now I'm clean through the word. And God, as a gentleman said, who will go for us? And, and Isaiah got the point pretty quickly. He wasn't addressed, but he got the point, and he said, well, here am I, send me. And God said, okay, I'll be fair with you. You're going to have to go, and you're going to preach, and every single person's going to leave town. Now that your tongue is purged, now that you're not a compromiser, but 10% will come back later. At that time, some of you men in this audience would have been so down because you have a tarnished image, and your image would have haunted you, and your finished work reference would have gone by the board, and your experience would have been your, your fallen nature, and you'd try to make it religious as you could, and try to pick up some legalistic habits to make it feel a little bit better. And some of you men would have felt you're unworthy, and you're no good when, when everybody leaves town. You would have said, now, this isn't right. The problem must be with me. Well, if you think the problem has to be with you, providing you're right with God, how about Jeremiah in 26.8? Even his king folks come against him, and everybody said he deserved to die. You see, When we have a new image through doctrine and the filling of the Spirit and we're confessed up to date and God purges, then when this takes place, this isn't this superficial holiness preaching. This is why God 
put a cover on signs, and we believe in signs, but he put a cover on the signs, and he said, Blessed are those that hear the word of God and keep it, and an evil generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it, but the eighth sign given in the Gospel of John of the resurrection in Luke 28, 29. You see, God gave the eighth sign in proving he was deity in the book of John was the resurrection. And he said, that's the new sign I want you to tune into and live in. Now, I'm not suggesting that I have to deny when I've done wrong. I name it and forsake it and confess it. I'm not suggesting that I cover up uh, things that aren't dealt with. I am suggesting that I bring them to the glorious light and have God reveal them and God take care of them. I'm not trying to get around being corrected. I'm trying to go through it, but to go through it with God on the throne of mercy. How many understand that? Because then and then only can I bear the new heavenly image and the image of the new man by acknowledging it in this manner. Now, I want you to notice this. When the Bible says that the lamp of God searches the inward parts of the emotions in Proverbs 20, 27. And David said, Search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. In Psalm 139, 23, 24, they were not occupied with self-examination, although they did indeed examine themselves. See, maturity comes from, from not thinking too deeply about yourself. Maturity is when a Christian does not think too deeply about himself. That's when you get mature. I'm not, introspection is a focus on self instead of Christ, and it's unbiblical. Introspection is a focus on self instead of Christ, and it's unbiblical. The problem must be dealt with, so we don't go around it. We go through it, but we go through it with the light of the finished work, with the glorious grace that justified us and the glorious love that keeps us by the power of God. For this reason, David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth, present active indicative, hey, theos, o gizomai, uh, he imputeth, that is to put to our account his favor, righteousness. God imputeth righteousness. And he imputes that righteousness without works. Now, think of this. This would do an, a mighty blow against introspection and extensive self-examination beyond acknowledging the truth, discovering the truth, and bringing it into its grace perspective. Now, verse 7, Blessed are they whose iniquities, and notice we said, Hey, Anomaya, Hey, Anomaya, whose iniquities, are... Uh, what? Forgiven. Athemai, for forgiven. Aris, passive indicative. Apo, from. He might have sinned. It means God dismissed him and sent him away and removed him forever. And they're not to be counseled back in your soul. When God forgives iniquities, you don't go and search them out and counsel them. That's a transgression of grace. One of the most difficult sins that people commit is transgressing finished work grace. That's why Hebrews 12, 15 talks about uh, failing, don't fail the grace of God. And Galatians 5, 4 isn't Arminian like some ignorant people say it is. It's don't fall from grace. You have fallen from grace. Didn't say they lost their salvation like some people that never study the original. It says you have fallen from grace. And when I let somebody counsel my sins that have been forgiven, I am falling from grace and I'm going to be self-conscious instead of conscious of my new nature and my new man in Jesus. How many understand that? I just think that that's never been settled about when I was 11 years old. And I just got to get that settled. And oh, when I was 12, 13, what happened? The effects. Oh, well, blessed are those whose iniquities, the effects of sins, are forgiven dismissed, removed by God Almighty, and whose sins, now we're getting a difference between iniquities and sins. 
Kai, Han, Ha, Hamatia, the coordinating conjunction plus the feminine plural noun, the nominative case, the instrument there, the coordinating conjunction Kai, Kai is used in eight ways, but here Kai uh, is going to make an indication of, the, of sins, Anomia and Hamatia are especially, are equally forgiven. Now, one includes all sins and willful sin, intentional sin, and includes it with the idea of guilt. Now, God says, I forgive all willful sins, all intentional sin, and, and then I'll deal with the guilt that was caused by it. And then, Hamatia is also used of sin as the nature of man, as the root cause as well. So if you understood what this is teaching, it would revolutionize your practical life. Now, God cannot impute sin in verse 8. To whom, ho curious, the Lord, the Lord, here we have the definite article, will not, aris middle subjunctive, will not impute to put to someone's account, to lay to someone's charge, sin. Now this is interesting. Other than judicial violations that we have to pay for judicially in, in, to man, but God cannot lay a sin to somebody's charge. Why? Because Jesus paid for it on Calvary and bore sins and became sin in your place, the just for the unjust, satisfying the righteousness, integrity of God's justice, the holiness of God's essence in Psalm 85, 10 to 12. Now, shame on anyone that gets counsel about their sins, unless it's present tense, then that's fine. Maybe some loving person can help you. But unless it's present tense, or unless you're ignorant of doctrine, then it's perfectly all right to get counsel, unless you just need to be comforted and need compassion, and that's all right too for a season. And then there's a place for a godly counselor, providing the godly counselor's got it all together in his own head. Most, no, I won't say it. <laughs> now, I want you to see here what's happening. If iniquities are forgiven, they've been just sent away out of God's sight, out of omniscience knowledge, and sins are covered, if this is true, and God can impute sin, then you're free to enjoy a brand new nature, the Holy Spirit glorifying Jesus Christ through the mind of Christ, through the content of doctrine, through the categories of doctrine, and through the communion of doctrine in the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, then we begin to bear the image of no condemnation, no guilt. We, we fail, we have to name it and forsake it because we still have an old sin nature. But we do that immediately and forsake it and do not live in it and do not take grace as a license to sin. But this is a way a believer becomes amazingly happy. The believer becomes a happy Christian, practically speaking. How many understand that? Now, then, the question is, what, and I'll close with this, what do I believe? We said today that we are a personal being, and that means we have deep longings. Number two, we're a rational being, and that means we think. Number three, we're a volitional being, and that means we de make decisions. And four, we're an emotional being, that means we feel. So the psalmist panted and thirsted after God's living water. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink, and out of his emotions shall flow rivers of living water. That takes care of the deep longings that we have in the emptiness of our soul. Then the rational being, we begin to think with God and not human viewpoint. Volitional uh, part of us begins to choose God's provision, God's grace, God's love, God's provision in every situation of life. And then the emotions respond to the reflections of the new image born after Jesus Christ in the resurrection. So what do we believe? 
Sunday night's rap session. What do we believe? The question is, do we believe that Jesus Christ paid it all, did it all, and is all? Do we believe he lives inside of us? Do we believe we have his Holy Spirit? Do we believe that he freely gives us grace, the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness so that we can reign in life by one Jesus Christ? Do we believe that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound? Do we believe we are more than conquerors through him? Do we believe that ask and we receive, seek and you find, knock and it's open unto you? Do you believe that you're cleansed and purified by faith? Do you believe that you've had a catharsis through the blood of Jesus in Hebrews 9, 14 and John 15, 3? Do you believe that you are indeed brand new every day? The old things are passed away. Everything is new. The mercies are new every morning. The compassions are new every morning. And you go and receive them every morning. Your angel is there with you, observing, looking in under your salvation, Every morning, your, every night, your angels go back and report to God, your angel, or two angels in some cases, what you did with the grace. Of course, he knows, but he lets the angels minister. Do you believe, do you believe that every word of God about you in the finished work is, is true? Or have you problems in what you believe? And therefore, it's revealed by how you think, how you feel, an insecurity through a tarnished image, broken relationships through a fallen image. When you're saved and have God, you're living in the fall instead of the image of the resurrection. Father, dismiss us tonight with these truths. In Jesus' name, amen.